Looks like a small crowd today. Yeah. It does. Um. All right. Well, let's go through these quickly, I guess. Um. There's a KP Max to KP Min. Um, it's passing test now. It just needs to go through QA. Um, and we need to make a call on what the what the default setting should be. Um, I guess we can come back to that when we talk about your results. Um, same thing with BlueFest buffered IO equals true. It sounds like that isn't actually as big of an issue because um, the person who saw that didn't have um, the block cache turned up. Like that was that action was read ahead. Oh, that's what it was. Yeah. yeah. Okay. They're, they're still going to see reads though, right? So yeah. if you have buffered IO equals true and you have lots of free buffer right. cache, then that's sort you of a can, freebie. yep, then you can just get it for free. Yep. So I think the question is, is there a performance cost to doing it? Probably depends on whether or not your devices can absorb the large reads. Um, well, no, I mean, is there a, assuming that, um, Oh, other way the, the buffered the buffered reads and writes are going to be like infinitesimally slower than the direct reads and writes, and so the question is whether there's any downside to turn that on. So far, I have not seen downside. I've only seen upside, but you know, it's it's tricky, right? Yeah. Well, if the upside outweighs the downside, then. That seems like an easy call. <laughs> if you haven't seen it. So um, far, it seems like we benefit from it. But if we can perfectly figure out how to cache things like optimally without the page cache, maybe then it it goes away. Maybe then it's better. We just I don't think I think we're going to need to design something much more sophisticated than what we have now to make the advantage go away. That. Yeah. All right. So let me mark that as needs QA then, and um, uh, okay. Uh, the Diet thing merged. Oh no, it got rebased. I think it got merged. Um, micro optimization to make the Diet condition checks faster. So that's good. Um, op history thing from Peter merged. Um, I think we'll backport that, but let's let it sit in master a little bit just to make sure there aren't. Um, unexpected issues. Yeah, uh, one issue I have found uh, while working on it is that the uh, monitor started to crash uh, intermittently. I found out that uh, there was an off tracker and not uh, de initialized it during, this, during the uh, monitor shutdown, so I had to fix this. And I fixed this in this uh, pull request. Uh, I hope just there's nothing else uh, like that. Uh, cool. Okay. Um, let's see. I don't see an open. Is there an open pull request for this, or did it already merge? Did you, you say there was for this graph? Yeah, you said there was a fix. Yeah, it it's uh, in this uh, pull request. It was. Uh, oh, it's already in there. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, okay. Let's see. The blue star cache trimming interval is removed. Um, I think I need to change the logging level of the cache trim out stuff though, because it every shard sends something every 50 milliseconds at level 10, which it just fills up the log, <laughs> even when the OST is idle. So I'm going to turn that up. Um, and then read ahead was enabled for Jewel. That was merged. So that's good. Let's see. This mark. Pull request. Where is that one at? I think there's there. there's still a block by David on it. Um, I don't know if he still cares or not. Um, the last thing he mentioned was his other pull request. Yeah, but it's, it was so complicated. I wasn't so concerned about him. Yeah, it's, I think the deal is that it, it slightly changes the nature of how the logging works. Like it, it's now if you enable debug 10, I think it's logging more than it used to. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, 
yeah, I've been just kind of waiting for somebody to say if they care or not, I guess. No. <laughs> I don't care if they log in, changes. as long as the logging at default levels isn't, isn't totally broken. Right, this, this is if the logging levels turned up, right? So if if you're logging at 10 now, the logging is, I, if I understand correctly, I think the logging is just a little bit, it's like spread over a couple of like two lines instead of on one line. And there's some bit of data that gets logged more often than it used to. Um, from my perspective, getting all of the o string stream stuff out of like not processing yeah. that when we have yeah. logging disabled yeah. is the only thing I really care about. All the yeah. other stuff I don't really care. As long as, yeah. it, you know, the logging tells you whatever it needs to tell you, you know, whatever. All right. That sounds good. Now let's just proceed with this. I'll mark it. Not it's QA and okay. see if it's not on. I'll ping David later. Um, okay. Um, there's a improvement to assert to make it a little bit lower overhead. Sounds fine. Yeah, let's keep it reviewed, I guess. And uh, the EC read thing, I think, hit a crash. So that one needs that one needs to be bugged. Um, all right. And let's see, on all these no movement ones, I think all these are sort of waiting. Wait, 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 yeah. Yep, okay. Um, all right, well, Mark has a bunch of metadata results with RocksDB to share. Um, anything else people wanna talk about? Go ahead and stick it on the pad. I'll start, Mark. Okay. Sure. Um, so the gist of this, the, the reason for, for all of this is that, well, there's a couple of reasons, I guess. One, no one has really had a good idea of how much metadata that we generate um, with different workloads. People are always asking, well, you know, how much space should I devote for the DP device? Uh, you know, what, what, um, uh, you know, what should I buy? That kind of thing. And the other part of this is that, um, even beyond just how much metadata we have in, in RocksDB, there's also a question of caches and how much space should be devoted for onode cache, how much space should be devoted for block cache. Um, in the block cache, how much of that space is being used for indexes and filters? There, there's kind of all of these unknowns. So um, over the last week, I've been going through and looking at how much space we are actually using in RocksDB for different kinds of workloads. Uh, there's a ton of data uh, that I'm, I'm going through and trying to do a write-up now. So this is just really a, a high-level overview of kind of what I saw um, that I'll talk about today. And I, I didn't even link any of the, the current graphs or data or anything in there. But, um, but the, the very high-level gist of this is that um, how much it's intimately tied to the number of objects that we have, which probably makes sense, but it's not something we like to talk about. We don't want it to be tied to the number of objects, but it really is. Um, and how many objects you can store is really intimately tied to the min alloc size in 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 uh, Blue Store. So if you have a high min alloc size and you are writing out like 4K objects in RGW, you're going to use a heck of a lot more space than you are if you use like a 4K min alloc size. Um, so having said that, um, the difference between using RBD with like four megabyte objects and doing 4K objects in RGW is, is vast. If you're doing small writes, like 4K writes to an RBD volume, um, for a 256 gigabyte RBD volume, we're using maybe one gigabyte of metadata. It's really small, and the indexes and filters is are tiny. It's like two, maybe 25 megabytes of indexes and filters. Um, the the per object metadata is higher. It's maybe like 11k. Um, but we have so few objects because they're large four megabyte objects is that it it really doesn't matter. It's it's still tiny. It doesn't. It's not a big deal. But on the other hand, if you're doing RGW. Um, 
it's like 2K of, of metadata for every 4K object. So 256 gigs of, um, of 4K objects in RGW, uh, you'll, you'll be using like 128 gigs of, of metadata. So if your workload is tiny objects in RGW, you need a heck of a lot of DB space to be able to cache everything without it rolling over to the block device. And the indexes and filters are large too. It's like, uh, I think it was 1.2 gigabytes of indexes and 800 megabytes of filters, which definitely exceeds our current defaults. So that's in that 256 kind of, gigs of gigs. data. Yeah. Okay. Yep, so that's, that was 64 million objects on one OSD. So our current defaults are kind of basically good up to around 16 million objects. Once you get bigger than that, and that's 16 million RGW objects. If it was 16 million RBD objects, it'd be more, but 16 Everyone million RBD objects is really huge. high and better because, well, very large numbers of objects is a, definitely a thing. We're trying to, we're trying for you know, large, you know, hundreds of millions, but 4K objects, we're, we're not storing those in any, in any RGW yeah. workload, period. Yeah. Are, th are there any users that do, though? Because I was under the impression that there were some people out there that were doing like tiny. Sure. Well, when people use that language, they, they, they mean like 64K, 128K. That's a small object in RW. Yep. Okay. And, and there are some okay. massive workloads on, 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 those, on, the, on that scale. And, and people want to yeah. do that. But, 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 but below that, uh, you, yeah. know, block, you know, my, 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 uh, 4K block rights, no way. Yep. So, okay. So, so this is obviously like a worst case scenario, right? You know, this oh, yeah, is but... 4K Minalic, tiny little objects. Yeah. Um, but well, okay, I, let's say I, I agree with Matthew and I agree with you that this, but I, we have seen people put a lot of small objects there and we don't, we, we discourage them from doing it, but they've done it. Well, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that at all. I agree with you. I, so I'm, I'm not saying don't, don't optimize for this. We, we know we want to, we want to optimize for massive object counts. I, I'm just pointing out that no one's doing 4k. <laughs> sure. Sure. So, so, you know, okay, say 64K, then divide this by 16, you know, so on 256 uh, gigs of, of 64K objects, and I actually have data for that. I tested that. Um, let me take a look and see exactly what it was. Um, so for a 64K RGW workload with the default 16K min alloc size on SSD, then we were talking about roughly, um, six and a half gigs of metadata on a 256 gig object corpus yep that's like three yep. percent so yep so not bad but still significant right so if you've got like eight terabyte um ssds which some people are now um starting to to look at um 20 gigs Something well like that's that. more than 20 gigs right it's 6.5 Eight times four, thirty-two times six and a half. So that would be two hundred gigs. Well, whatever eight times six and a half is. Eight yeah. terabytes. Or thirty-two times six and a half. Sorry. Yeah, two hundred gigs. Okay, that's a lot. Yep. So yeah, two hundred gigs of metadata for like eight terabytes of sixty-four k. Yep. yep, but that's <clears> the total metadata. metadata. If you look at the filters and the rocks of filters indexes and filters that's going to be about two percent of that and so that'd be four gigs mm -hmm. of ram for the indexes and filters which is pretty modest right well maybe i mean it depends on how full you're shoving how, how yeah. full you're making your 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 nodes i mean that plus the blue store cache means that if you want those indexes and filters cached and you want you know a decent amount of onode cache I and mean, we might be talking like 10 gigs of rss yeah. memory per Ceph OSD process yeah All right so the the current kv min branch does a 50 50 split between blue store and rsdb so yeah you'd want 10 gigs of ram basically for blue store or for the osd and then five would go to the the issue with that, though, is that in RAM limited situations, you are really over subscribing the, the block cache for like RBD workloads. You're going to see a slowdown because more of that optimally would be going to the O node cache. Yeah. 
you don't need anywhere near that much block cache for RBD in that, except in the case where you already are caching all the blue store O nodes. And the only reason you want block hash then is so that compaction yeah. Yeah. reads yeah. Are, are not hitting the disk. Okay, so if we, if we think of this and if we assume that we only have a simple solution where we have sort of a fixed balance between blue store and RocksDB, then we want to prevent the worst case, presumably, right? And that 50% would mean that you'd have to get a dedicate 10 gigs of RAM to the OSD in order to effectively cache a one, eight, an eight terabyte <laughs> SSD with all full of tiny RTW objects, which seems doable. Um, if we move the needle closer to blue store, then that number goes up, but we'll have better cache utilization for RBD, right? Yeah, if, if you see the kind of last point I make here in this whole thing is I think the priority that we want is indexes and filters first, O node second, maybe tied with OMAP depending on the workload, and then SSTs for compaction last, which kind of like gives us this weird, like, you know, if this, then this, then this, then this pattern going between Blue Store and RocksDB. Well, I think the, um, the 2B and the 3 are kind of the same. Well, so actually, sorry, this is RocksDB indexes and filters, right? The, the workload is different though, right? Because the OMAP reads are going to look different on the SSD than the compaction reads are going to look. Yeah, but the, the memory, if the memory is given to, to RocksDB, then it can serve the block cache to service OMAP reads. And if we give it to RocksDB, it'll also service the SSDs yeah. for compaction, right? It's, yeah, it's the, the difference though is that. From the testing that we did, RBD workloads are going to slow down if you're stealing from the O-Node cache to do it, and the O-Node cache isn't already totally cached. Yep. yep. That's that's the pet price you're going to pay for it. Okay. So we are sort of. Here's my concern. Um, yep. So if if I read Mark your email and it sounds like if we do what you're suggesting, we're going to have three caches going on. The Linux buffer cache for uh, the, you know, the RocksDB cache and the O-Node cache. And um, I don't, I, I think what you were suggesting is if you give it all to RocksDB, then somehow that lessens the evil, but it's not an ideal situation. I think the only way it lessens the evil if we give it to RocksDB is if we ditch the encoding, decoding, and figure out whether or not we can kind of make up for it by letting RocksDB compress some of the block cache. Yeah, but that, I think that's, that, not, that's not feasible in the short term, right? Yeah. I think that's long term. That's more where we're going with the C store or whatever the hell we call it. But um not with them yeah e either that or we ditch the concept of using a, a key value store that requires compaction i mean that's the other trade-off right you know there's there's multiple kind of directions you yeah. could head but yeah we just don't have a good candidate for that <laughs> yeah exactly so we could write one or we it's could um right. or we could you know try to make things more more um happy for RocksDB. Make, make RocksDB yep. happier. Um, I, have an, I have a related question about compaction because that seems to be the root of the issue here. So um, with this RBD workload that Micron was, well, that, that this partner was doing, um, it's a common workload, 4KB, you pre-populated the volumes. So you would think that if you're doing random writes to pre-populated volumes, there would be no metadata change Therefore, there would be no need for compaction because the, the thing is changing. You only have to compact it if it's in flux, right? Am I missing something? The checksum changes, right? 
I, I missed. I'm sorry. I missed. I missed the. Could you could you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah. Sure. No problem. Um, so, my thinking is, you've got this. Let's say you've got a uh, set of RBD volumes. You fully populated them, so there's no allocation going on to those volumes when you do writes. Correct. Um, and let's assume that we're doing 4KB writes and the min alloc size is bigger than 4KB, so we're, we're going to be writing in place. We're not going to be allocating new space to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you would think, I mean, I would think, because I don't know Blue Store like you folks do, that the metadata doesn't have to change because all we're doing is writing data over writing data. So the, why are we yeah, doing it, compaction? It does change, though, because um, two reasons that the data has. Checks that different checksums, so the checksums change. Yeah. And the second reason is that every time we update an object, we update the attribute object, whatever that has um, the object info that has the version and the log entry and the timestamp and all that random crap. So there's there's metadata churn as you do writes. But I think in this, as Mark mentioned, in the RBD case, like it's small. There's not a lot of metadata. So there will be compaction, yes, but you're, it's not that much metadata, given the amount of data. One, one of the things I think that might be triggering, triggering all this compaction that we're seeing, uh, there's a link in there for reads during writes compaction. It happened to be I had some data laying around that I was able to go back and analyze. Um, and there is a lot of time spent in compaction there. I really wonder if it's all of the PG log and dupe ops keys coming in that are making it just like thrash and compaction because it's not getting the tombstones fast enough. I, I could be wrong, but I, I, I really I am suspicious to, about it. The way to test that is to run that same workload without failures with the, the min PG log entries and max PG log entries to like 10 and the, the min or the log in. PG min and trees trim or something, number of trims at the same time also reduce that to 10. What that, if I that the keys are disappearing almost immediately and then see? I've got a branch where I ripped log operation out and then also um, we could set dupe ops up to the, or the threshold up so the dupe ops aren't happening. Would yeah. that, I mean, that that's, so I like getting I. rid of it entirely, but yeah. Yeah. Would that, would that cover us? Um. Yeah, I think I'd prefer to just create them and delete them quickly, but um, but maybe not. Yeah, that would yeah that would tell us similar. Maybe similar thing. maybe both. Let's do yep. both so that we can see if yep. there's any significant change in the behavior. So there's going to be a performance difference if you're not logging them at all. Yes. Um, and I'm worried that might obscure the might scale the um, overhead we see from compaction because you're going faster or slower. Yeah. I mean, in pet store, getting rid of log operation was huge. That was like a, a, a massive reduction in CPU overhead. But I mm -hmm. didn't actually look at blue store, what happens when you get rid of log operation in terms of like database rights. Yeah. I didn't, I haven't looked at that yet. So that would be very interesting. Okay. So <clears throat> coming back to the, the sort of the, the main point here, it feels to me like there, are, I see sort of two two points in the solution space. Um, one is um, what's in the branch right now, which basically is a 50-50 split between BlueStore and RocksDB. And that's clearly not perfect, but it's better than what we have right now. <laughs> um, and it, it means that um, if you know that your cluster is all block or that it's all KV heavy, then you could tune that knob if you wanted to but the default is sort of middle of the road and we'll do okay um, with the two. Um, and the second point I see is that what we could do is um, we have the new pool tagging, uh, metadata associated with pools that identifies what the use case is. And so from that, we should be able to infer that this is an RBD pool, which means there's no KV, it's all block object stuff or it's an RGW index pool, or it's an RGW data pool, or whatever it is. So for each of these given like pool types, we can figure out what the how much of it is key value and how much of it is blocks. 
And then for given OSD, we look at what the PGs are. You have like, I have 12 PGs that are all data and I have 12 PGs that are 50% KV and I have four PGs that are 100% KV or whatever it is. And you can come up from that, you can just come up with a blend that, oh, well, based on this, I think that 80% of my data should go to RxDB because there's more KV or 20% of my memory should go to RxDB because it's more block. I want to, uh, I want to contend your point that the 50-50 split is actually better. Okay. Right now, with our current settings, we appear to be good up to around 16 million RGW objects on one OSD. And even after that, we're probably still not bad, but that's the point at which the indexes and filters are start going to start getting paged out okay. for, for SST files. So I guess the question in my mind is, do we have any idea for most of our users how many objects per OSD, even on big clusters, we end up seeing? Because I mean, 16 million objects on one OSD is a fair amount. File store doesn't even handle that. Filestar falls over when we get up to about that many objects because of the way splitting works. So I I wonder, do we really have users that are doing significantly more objects per OSD than that right now? I, I'm sure we will as we kind of get bigger, but I'm... It was falling over for um, that partner, right? And they were doing no, it that's, with like 5%. That, so that's what chance. it looked like. That's what that's, that's what it looked like, change. but they were mistuned. They had no yeah. compaction read ahead, and they were doing lots of reads during compaction. It was not indexes and filters. I'm, I'm almost 100% sure of that. Could be wrong, but everything we've seen so far indicates this is not an issue with issue with the indexes and filters being um, being you know paged in and out of memory. Yeah, I'm not saying it's that, wrong. The, no, the thing that worries me is, is the, the way that it currently works is a cliff. Like we literally cap the amount of memory that RocksDB can ever yeah. use at 512 megs, which is just yeah. insane to me, right? Yeah. Um, so right now our lab cluster has about 45 million objects total across- How many OSDs? A lot, um, well, not a lot. It's got uh, 45 million across where can I find it? 100 OSDs, but it's 3x replication, so it's across 30 OSDs. So it's like, I don't know, one and a half million objects per OSD, maybe. Okay. So it's doing okay. Um, but it's mostly FFS, mostly big files. So this is mostly large objects. Um, okay. I, yeah, the, I, I think that I, I think you're right with the a, a common scenario that I see, and that's this is a, even where the like the 64 kilobyte test is more representative, but it isn't exactly what I think most users will do, where they'll have a bunch of hard disks or a slower pool for the RGW data, and then they'll have a bunch of dedicated NVMe SSDs for just the indexes, because there you're just going to have 100 percent 100 percent key value data on the whole OSD, right? And so if it's a if it's a four terabyte NVMe, you're going to have four terabytes <laughs> of metadata, <laughs> or you know three point four whatever eighty percent is. Um, and then the indexes are going to be what um, you know like four percent of that, three percent of that total. Um, you know, so it's going to be like one hundred sixty gigabytes. 20 gigabytes for um, the indexes and filters. Well, one right. one way to maybe that seems like a lot. Yeah, I was gonna say that's I've that that seems not quite right. But um, we're what is it? it's about two percent. I guess it looks like it's about two percent of the total metadata is. The indexes and filters <clears throat> from your Let's numbers see. here. You had 124 gigs of metadata, and it resulted in two gigs of important stuff that we need to have cached. Um, so for 64k RGW writes, we had like 6,750, 60 megabytes 
of data, metadata, and then we had 62.8 plus 42.1 of indexes and filters. Um, so what does that end up working out to be? That would be 67, 60. Uh, that's like 1.6%. So you're close, 2%, yeah. but 1.6%. Yeah. So four terabyte in Vimy, which is pretty big, it would lead to like mean or on the order of 50 gigs of RAM. If it's like 80% capacity and the 1.6% or whatever, <clears throat> somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. So that means that if they use completely default settings, then they would have to have double that and they would waste half the RAM <laughs> um, because half of it would be given to Blue Store, which would be caching not that many nodes. Um, I, I but, still wonder if this means that we should have RBD specific and RGW specific settings for this. Right, so that's what I was getting at with the tuning, with the pool yep. settings, because in practice, it's going to be, I think, um, sometimes you're going to have pure RGW and sometimes you're going to have pure RBD data, but it's going to be a blend most of the time. And so if you can figure out how to blend it, um, that's sort of the, that's sort of the command and control <laughs> top down version. The other way to approach it would be look at what the hit rate is on the two caches and try to balance it that way. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, that might make more sense because then we can sort of tune it accordingly. But If we know the number of objects in each pool, it looks like across these tests, it's not exactly the same, but it's we have clusters yeah. for RGW and, and, um, and, and we, RBD in terms of the size of the, the metadata. We do know the number of objects per pool, but again, it's a little bit weird because um, in the OMAP object case, we don't know how many OMAP keys there are. And that's actually, it could be, you know, objects that have four key value pairs, or it could be objects that have 10,000 key value pairs, just like yeah. multiple orders of magnitude off. So we don't, I don't know that that's a, a good enough, um, we can choose a middle of the road, but I'm, This is I'm sort of changing my tune from the last couple of weeks. I'm I think in order to address this properly, it, we should just look at cash hit rates and and try yeah. to dynamically adjust. That's kind of where I was heading to. Do you either Sage? Do you or Matt? Do you know how often RGW objects are fragmented? Like you do partial writes to a, an RGW object? Is it usually just put or gets, or is it like weird? They're well, they're never fragmented. There's layers. Pardon me. The RGW objects say, are never fragmented, right? They're always written in there. The, data chunks, the, 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 the object data, no, never. But their right. OMAP right. activities can or have no have, right. don't, don't have strong animosity yep. on the heads. Right. So we should never end up in a situation where you have like lots of extents for a, an RGW object. Yeah. I mean, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, in a year or two, this might change uh, for some special tech cases. But 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 for now, that's right. There are other. Yeah. Okay. It seems like as long as we're just doing puts and gets, even regardless of the, the object size or the, the min alloc size and all this stuff, we end up with a relatively, not exact, but relatively um, tight cluster of average number of keys per object in the database. Mm -hmm. It, it does change some, and I think it's because there's there's you know a set of existing keys, so there's some just static you know, number of keys in the database regardless, you know, and then there's, there also may be um, uh, space amp in RocksDB where you have keys in multiple SST files that are for the same thing. You can have like a key repeated in multiple levels. So there's going to probably be some variation in that, but it seems like we have clustering you know, for fragmented RBD and then non-fragmented puts and gets in RGW. We might be able to infer something from that on kind of how many keys per object you should expect. Which means you can't do fast into the, the, what they call the private education, CAS or CMA, or what is that? Yep. Again, I think, yeah. What is it, though? Northeastern thing? It's all these. Hey, Ben, can you mute?
I muted him. There we go. Um, oh, he unmuted. <laughs> there we go. It was a race condition. Um, I think the yeah, I I, I just worry about um, the number of steps and inferences and approximations that we make. Just kind of trying to work back to this is like so high yeah. that I'm I'm very skeptical of the result. Um, I think we'll get almost as good with the like 50 50 <laughs> version. Um, oh, I don't know about that. Yeah, no, no you're probably right. But um, as far as like how, return on return on complexity investment, but how bad would it be just to look at the number of objects in different pools at st OSD startup and then just get, you know, kind of a guess from that and then run with it until the next time the OSD is restarted? Yeah, I mean, we could do it every you know few seconds. Like doing a startup versus online, I don't think really changes much. Okay. It's not that hard. Um, okay. But it's yeah, it's so. I think okay. So my proposal is still to start with the the current KVMN branch because it's better than what we have. Um, and then I think the question is, if the end goal is that we're watching the hit rates on RocksDB and on the Blue Store cache and sort of dynamically adjusting based on that, um, the question is if we want a midpoint, something that's not quite auto-tuning, but um, is sort of a guess on the way there. Sure. Yeah, but, I don't know. Let, I don't let, know. Let me let me publish the data that I've got because that might inform kind of whether or not how good a guess would be versus looking at hit rates, right? Like you know how yeah. how how tightly clustered the 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 amount of keys per object and the you know kind of size of the the data block per per kind of workload or per you can even get down to like per object. Um, I mean, if you could propose a uh, and a heuristic or algorithm or whatever you want to call it, then we can just look at that. I think that would, that's going to be, I think that's going to be easier than independently trying to digest a wall of numbers in a spreadsheet and come up with something. Sure. Um, okay. I think that the numbers you can, the things that the metrics that are probably the most useful are the object count in the, in the pool. And there's also a, um, I believe there is a KV, a number of objects, a number of objects, and there's also a number of objects that have KV data. Um, objects. Let me see where it is. Um, is that right? Num objects OMAP. Yes. So you have an object count, and you also have the number of those objects that have one or more OMAP keys. Okay. Which doesn't necessarily tell you how big the OMAP objects are, but you can probably kind of assume that if we don't really have, I think, any objects that have both, that use both data and OMAP, um, at least not in any significant quantity. So do you think that differentiating that is, is a big deal if we kind of know how many objects we have and how big the DB is? I mean, the problem is that we don't know how big the OMAP data is. We don't have accounting for that. If we did, that would, this would all be really easy. But we don't we don't have that information. Why do we need it? I guess is the question I'm I'm asking. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many objects there are. That's just a proxy for how much metadata we have. So what what really matters, looking at your your stuff here in the pad, is 124 gigabytes of metadata. Right? That's the important part. <clears throat> that's what determines how big the indexes and filters are, roughly. Um, Ooh. Right. Whereas if you have the RBD case, then you have only you know two gigabytes of metadata, which means that you have a tiny bit of end indexes and filters, right? It's, that's what, it's how many based on the, you have and how big are they? It, it's maybe better to look at it from the standpoint of how many keys do you have. 
Right. Because like the, the filter bits are dependent on, or they're really static usually. Right. Um, oddly so in the RW case, it's bigger than it should be, but. Um, so but, that would be best. If we knew the number of keys, that would be the best. Good would be, or better would be the amount of metadata total, how big is RxDB, and the least good would be the number of objects, because that's a very coarse proxy for the number of right? We we can ask RxDB what number of keys are, though. I think yeah, we can get that can from ask. it. Yeah, OK. OK. Um, the, the only kind of hitch in this plan, or the, the thing that is make a little bit more complex, is that we're supposed to have 20 bits per key for filters. Um, for some reason, in the RBD case, is 28, which I just kind of assumed was maybe due to like padding and stuff for the on disk format. But for some reason, with RGW, it's really consistently hanging out at around like 46. And I have no idea why. I don't know why it's different. But each of those workloads is making that number off a little bit yeah. from what we specify in the config. Um, but can you can you ask Rocks to be what that is? I can calculate like we, it from the how big the filter block is and how big how many entries there are. Yeah, or we could guess. Like if we could ask Rocks to be how big are you? It'll tell us that. It'll tell us how many bytes. You can ask it. I don't know if you can ask it how many. I guess you can ask it how many keys. I can't remember what the what the API tells you. Uh, we can even ask it directly, how big are all the filter blocks for all the SST files? And how yeah. big are all the index blocks for all the SST files? And then just like be like, OK, here's how much we're going to give it. That's That, that would be perfect. <laughs> so, um, and then, um, yeah. Because yeah. Hey, it feels like that's the, that's the min. So instead of yep. having the min be a gig or whatever, it's like, mm -hmm. At a minimum, make sure all that stuff's cached. And once that's in cache, yeah. you know, plus a 20% buffer or something, then start divvying up the memory else other way. Then a 50-50 yeah. thing, I think, would be fine. Because I don't, don't care so much after that. We, we might want to ask it how much that is and then just give it some padding, right? And say, OK, yeah. we're going to expect this to grow some. So here's some extra padding. And then the next mm -hmm. time the, OSD, the OSD restarts, or maybe just periodically we re-ask it. Yeah. Yeah, we can do this like once a minute or whatever. We can like just reevaluate. It's yep. not. And we can stuff. change the block cache dynamically. I don't know how to do it, but I saw someone reference it once in mm -hmm. in the the like in a bug somewhere that hey, we can just dynamically resize the cache. So someone claimed that you can do it. I've I don't I've never seen how to do it, but someone claimed yeah. that it's possible. <laughs> yeah. That sounds reasonable. Okay. Just one quick question. I mean, are you assuming that all data is equally accessed? And you know, is that real? Is that realistic? I mean, our synthetic tests do that, but in the real world, is that really the case? And or would we be overestimating what we need? Yeah, I think in the real world that's not the case. Um, my hope would be that it would. Um, once you basically have a pool of memory and you're putting a divider and you're saying over here it's RocksDB and over here is blue store. Um, my hope would be that within each of those halves that we could use the memory most effectively and that it wasn't it isn't necessary to move the division point that much. So for example, if you have um, a bunch of hot RocksDB data and a bunch of cold RocksDB data, we have enough in the pool and RocksDB is part of the pool to fit all the indexes and filters in there. But if half the store is totally idle, then those will get booted out and we'll be caching, you know, some OMAP stuff that's hot or something like that. Yeah. Right. And did it on the blue store side. I think um, the reason we really want the indexes and filters and cache is so that we avoid the prospect of having to like multiple well, I guess, and lookups and Yeah. I mean, maybe maybe I'm over overvaluing having those in cache versus having to read the filter into cache. Maybe it's not that bad. I mean, they're, they're, let's see how big they are. So, I mean, so it, it's it would be a tiny read. <clears throat> so like these SST files for a 64K RGW workload, 
the filter blocks are usually around like 270k. So that's not, I mean, that would be like a, a big read to read it in. Yeah, maybe and then it's you not have that to, bad. You have to oh. traverse it, and then you do another I/O. So it adds another I/O and some extra CPU to every request, right? Which adds up. But but as Ben's saying, maybe if you don't, you're yeah. not like going over the whole thing, and it's really just you know within some number of SST files your workload. Maybe maybe in practice you're really not doing that very often. I don't know. Yeah. Well, if it, so, you you wrote this cache priority, <clears throat> which I think makes sense. But it seems if we can if we can use the RocksDB interface to query the size of the indexes and filters, then we can do exactly well. We can do priority one is number one, and um, and then two and three are sort of fifty fifty. Like that would be trivial to do, right? Yeah. And then if we wanted to get fancy, we could balance two and three by looking at the hit rates. Ben's comment is making me wonder, though. Maybe, maybe he's right. Maybe maybe an index and filter read isn't that bad if it doesn't happen very often, compared to the prospect of doing more O node reads. Maybe the the blue star O node cache really is you know doing a miss there. Maybe that's worse than the prospect of doing like an index filter miss. It's um, it's tricky because the if you miss an O node, if you miss the O node cache, then you're gonna have to go do the Rocks to be IOs. The O node cache isn't as memory efficient, so you'll cache less stuff, but you'll sort of speed things up more. Um, the reason that you want the filter in cache, right, is so that you can do those X adder checks really fast when you're doing a write, like a new write. So if you're doing like a put on a non-existent object, you do X adder lookups on it, right? To see if it's already there. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah. So that's why we want the filters in cache is because every time you do that, you're going to have to be going through and looking for through yeah. every SST file, right? Um, through to layer. But you're randomly, yeah. So you have for to any check given, every single filter, don't you? You have to check each layer. So whichever SST, you know, you have like a hundred and whatever, however many SSTs are in each layer, you're going to check one of them in each in each layer. So usually three checks for however many levels you have. Why only one in each layer? Why not all? Why don't you have to traverse everything? Because you know what key it is, and so you know which SST it would land in. So you only need to check uh, which. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You're right. Okay. So as long as you, so so the I guess then this the the balancing act of what's your likelihood of getting a filter miss in that that you know looking at each level and and potential in each level of of missing you know if your level 0 level 1 filters are more likely to be cached than like your level 5 filters what's your likelihood of actually missing and mm -hmm. yeah. how does that balance out versus the the owner cache or not It's too many variables. <laughs> yep, I agree. This is all very complicated. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think that I think where you started um, makes sense. That we should start by spending the memory on the indexes and filters, and then after that, it it matters less. Um, so I think my suggestion is that we look at how we can query rocks to be to get the size of those and use that to allocate the cache memory. The other thought that I keep coming back to is how much of this matters if we find out that the PG log and dupe ops and all that stuff is really just causing like crazy stuff happening 
if and you know can we, maybe, can we just stop doing that <laughs> let's find out <laughs> let's not, let's yeah, stop doing exactly. that. Maybe, yep. yeah yeah Yep. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe making Roxy be happy just kind of makes all of this not as big of a deal. Yeah. I don't, I don't think doing those operations in log make time makes sense. I think you already kind of know that, and you've already got. got we, we got. We're, 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 we're driving towards that, so we'll just, I think I'll just make things better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Eh, These feel like anyway. two related, but orthogonal, mostly orthogonal pieces. But. All right. Does anybody have anything they want to talk about that's not RocksDB before we eat up all our time? Uh, maybe a quick question about the status of uh, CSTAR. Mm -hmm. uh, I've made some. Uh, I've made some additional profiling. I was curious why on the read path on my uh, development machine, why I'm seeing a lot of a lot of impact from instruction caches, from data caches, from TLBs, from branch predictor buffers, from everything, literally everything in processor, in CPU, that requires a warm up to work effectively. Uh, so switch to the, uh, I've switched to investigation of, of things that could affect all of them like syscalls mm -hmm. and it seems that we have around uh, in 4k uh, during four kilo uh, run trees we have around uh, seven uh, syscalls per each single operation most of them uh, are a few texts each of uh, of the tp osd tp workers uh, needs to research uh, around four times to kernel only because of uh, of the kernel uh, of the kernel site uh, part of Futex. Why aren't Futex is being? Uh, 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 why, why are we? Why, why aren't we ending up in? Um, sorry. Uh, no. Okay. I'll check my levels there. Two reasons. Yeah. Well, yeah. Why are we? Why are we getting the adapted part, the user space part? Yeah. Uh, Futexes are Futexes are used uh, to construct uh, synchronization primitives. For instance, to construct a mutex. If you have a contention of, uh, of mutex, then threads, uh, a thread needs to uh, go to kernel. It calls the, sys the futex syscall. So, so the point uh, is, wait, is it's, arising, it's arising from direct contention, in other words. Yep. However, opposite could, uh, situation could also appear uh, appears. Uh, because few texts are used also uh, to constitute the conditional variables. So if you have a long pipeline divided into uh, stages with a uh, synchronization between, between stages uh, implemented on top of conditional variables, you will face, uh, a, you will face a load from, uh, from the kernel side of uh, few texts as well. So, if, well, for the, for the non the non CSR path, can you just be doing lock free? There is a good, there is a good chance for that. C start could help here, I guess. Well, you don't need to, well, well, separate, well, in parallel, I th well, I'm saying in parallel. I mean, there's you know the practical lock freedom sort of approaches may not be as good as C star. I think they're you know they're they're categorically yes, not. And, they, and, they don't they don't follow the minima stuff, but we could be using them anyway, right? And yep, I think we're yep, kind of yep, 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 yep. exactly. Uh, Oh, sorry, we in the default configuration uh, for uh, for SSDs, we have two worker, two working uh, threads, two workers per each shard. And uh, when we are picking uh, a job, PG item to do, uh, we are locking it. We are not trying to lock, and if it's uh, contended, get, get uh, food and get something unrelated. Nope, we are sleeping. We are waiting. We are going to kernel. Mm -hmm. Anyway, is that, uh, is there a problem there? It's yeah. Anyway, it's sister a, could also help. Yeah. It's it's tricky because the the PG the next PG work item is coming out of the priority queue implementation, which is hidden behind its own abstraction. So, being able to like say, give me 
a couple things that I could do, <laughs> and I'll pick one. Um, will be a little bit tricky. Um, the other thing is that it's this is it feels like a kind of a short term fix because once we do go to C star, then we won't do that anymore, right? Well, I, I mean, I, I hate to upset any Apple cards, whatever, but. How quickly could we, could we could we converge on C star? And if even if we could, yeah. how quick could, could all workloads converge on C star? Could all the reference architectures converge on C star? I mean to say. I mean, there's it's one it's one OSD, so it's all it's going to be all C star or, or none, <laughs> right? Uh, how quickly that's going to happen? So I mean to say, another will there, will there, will there, is there no likelihood that? In, in a, you know, in a, more than a year or two out, that there'll be some 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 deployment architectures where where we're where we're, where we're using something else, or, or you know, do we do we land on C star and, uh, all the way for everything? And, and, and uh, I mean, my my assumption has been that we'll refactor the core OSD I/O engine <laughs> to be C star based, and and always C star based. We won't be maintaining multiple implementations of the IO subsystem. Um, okay. I mean, right. and, and some of the things going in. I mean, so so this I guess where so maybe you know I, I I'll just talk. I mean, you know, I like the not 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 burden this entire call, but I mean, so I mentioned yeah. you know we 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 you know, in our core stuff we had we, we we threw around just simple lock free you know the, the standard. Mm -hmm. Lock free primitives, and, and, and I know they're going in and out of Z star anyway. But but it, but 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 I see a need for to, to look to look ser ser seriously at stuff up front. What could mm -hmm. we do in in a short time frame, even if we don't worry about yeah. code deployment? Yeah. And and I love the idea of of of, 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 of bashing on these on these sleep queues because they yeah. they're they are a source of of, of high latency. Is uh, they are they are a source of scheduling unexpected scheduling and other stuff. Right. That's what's that's what's killing us here. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in this analysis because of that, but I think but I think the solution is to try to experiment, or, the, or at least the thing I would do next, try to experiment with ways to, to take to take those locks and sleeves out. Yeah, yeah and uh, I'd like to remind you that uh, during work on this uh, uh, history optimization, I also ran into problems working with the conditionals, which uh, simply made things uh, slower than uh, before I even tried to use it. So uh, I think. Uh, Removing conditionals from at least some of the paths might be uh, beneficial. I'm not yep. sure how beneficial. It depends on the um, well, logical if, machinery. If the but it's, it's, it's worth if the, trying. If the, yeah, exactly. If the, if, the, if, if the contention does not cannot be made to decline, then we'll then we'll pay for then we'll, then we'll pay in busy weights something for it, but we won't enter the kernel. So I think yeah. that yeah. So. Seems like that. So one one direction would be to do an adaptive mutex where we spin a bit before we go to sleep. Um, I don't know. If Except that's, that's what the mutexes are. That's what the that's what our p mutexes already are. Maybe they're mistuned, but I don't know. At p thread mutexes are. They, they, uh, they, uh, no, I'm, I'm actually. I'm not sure that, but I'm pretty sure that the ones in Linux are. Uh, I'm actually using a spin lock uh, on the user land mm -hmm. uh, with uh, adaptive sleep. So it does sleep okay. for at most well, yeah, yeah, you can just see what you're, seconds you're when there's something to do. Yeah. Well, that's fine. All, all I'm saying is that, that when, you, when you call me Peter Linux Lock or whatever on Linux on, on a Linux environment, I mean, I think it does spin. It has, there's, it has, had, has had that for years. But I mean, if the spin lock is better, that's great. And we could use that. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe there are opportunities there. But I think that, so if I, I'm trying to think of where these the key context switches are. One is in, there's stuff in the messenger. Um, that's, I think, not something that we can very easily address. There's the one that Radoslav mentioned when we're dequeuing a PG, where we could choose another PG to work on instead. Maybe it's worth doing a simple proof of concept where you hack up one of the, the schedulers to give you the next event and requeue the one that you didn't successfully lock and just see if it makes a difference. Um, the other one, though, is that um, the IO completions are put on a finisher, and those, um, yeah, there's a there's a context switch there, and those ones are hard to do because they're they're put in, they're executed from different thread thread contexts to eliminate deadlocks, um, not so it's hard to just get rid of that. Um,
Although also, they might be running, they might be running from. Let me look at the code. Go ahead. Uh, what about uh, the uh, synchronization, uh, the interconnections between uh, Blue Star's uh, write pipeline? I mean, KV Sync uh, thread, KV Sync, uh, KV Final. That's what I was just looking at. Yeah. However, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, we have very, very good policy, uh, almost batching policy in uh, in those in this pipeline. So the traffic, so the relationship uh, between uh, waste of mutex and their the real work is isn't uh, so significant to to, yeah. to expect a huge optimization from that. Yeah, I think actually that the, like the KV sync, the KV finisher. They're, they're batches, so I, I'm, I'm not worried about that one. It's the um, it's the KV committed where we take the ah uh, yep 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 the, the, the actual connection between to a finisher. DPO, SD, DPO, the and KV, KV sync. It's it's the it's the, there's we have a, a a set of sharded finishers um that the actual completions for the aggregate queued on and that okay, those Mr. retake the lock and, and finish this bottom half right. Okay. That's like on committed on whatever. But still, uh, C star will could. It's not sure. It but however, I guess it could bring really really significant uh, benefit. It would allow us to have uh, to to implement batching in very 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 transparent way. Yeah. Uh, if we have uh, free the if we have free the same free operations uh, free operations of the same kind and each of them can be divided into uh, some stages let's say we have one operation abc and that, that is divisible to to stages one two and three mm -hmm. then instead of going synchronous we could try to trade some uh, latency for uh, for throughput and instead going uh, synchronously i mean one a1 to a uh, to uh, a3 etc yep. we could batch uh, we could re make some uh, reuse some uh, CPU localities like instruction cache to to handle uh, one A one B uh, B one C one then uh, switch uh, to to the to other to the other stage. Yep. Yep. Agreed. Um, but this requires. To have a reactor, uh, sister reactor, yeah. aware about the batching from the from the er, from the er, from its early days. Yeah. Well, coming back to your first point, I think the the main opportunity that I would see to try doing a tri lock and avoiding a few texts would be that dequeuing a PG. So I think that's the that's the proof of concept that I would try. Um, Maybe if your try lock fails, just DQ the next one and unconditionally do a blocking lock and wait on that one <laughs> and just move forward just for something simple that should work most of the time. Um, so from there. Or whatever, whatever makes sense. We'll take a look. Cool. Cool. Okay. Uh, from the all from the very different bucket, very quick question. Uh, do what uh, what is about policy for uh, backporting performance related stuff? I have uh, some uh, pull requests uh, that, uh, that I uh, that I backported to Luminous, but uh, still the branches are waiting uh, for some knowledge. I don't know whether we should. Uh, what about tracking? We are um, making. As long as they're low risk, then we should do it. We should definitely backport those things. Um, so I think maybe just send an email with links to the pull request so we can make sure that they get reviewed and then merge for the next point release. I think that's fine. We should try to merge them early so they get plenty of testing in the Luminous branch. But, okay, um, so sounds like we don't need to create extra uh, ticket on uh, on Tracker. No, I mean, if you want somebody else to do the backporting for you, then yes, you got to go create a ticket. Oh, but okay, if you're I, will, I, will, your own thing, I made my, just, my own, so. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think it's okay. Thanks. Cool. All right. Anybody else? All right, we're over time. Thanks, everyone. Good discussion. Thanks. Have a good day, guys. Thank you. Yeah, it was a great call. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Yeah. Yeah.